So I imagine those familiar with this channel probably think it is based around the original PlayStation and I mean, if you look at literally every video I've put out, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that. Although, originally when I started out, I had actually planned to cover games across a wide spectrum of platforms. It's just, when you fall down the PS1 rabbit hole, you uh, fall pretty deep, let's just put it that way. But after putting together a video covering a bunch of fan translated games on the platform, which turned out to not just be one of the more popular videos I've done, but also one of the most enjoyable to put together, I figure why not give the people what they want and do the same for another console, and what better console to do than my all-time favourite, the Sega Dreamcast. The gamiest games console that ever gamed, and I feel like if you're a Dreamcast fan you probably know what I mean by that. So sit back, relax and prepare yourself for some fan translated Dreamcast games, 23 to be exact, a good number that I absolutely don't say in a weird way. Now, as always, before we dig into the games, let's just do a little housekeeping to get you all up to speed. Firstly, all games featured today will be English language translations. There are many, many translations out there covering a wide variety of different languages, but this video will just be strictly highlighting English translations only. Secondly, while the majority of the games shown today will be complete and finished translations, some are still only partially translated or still in progress. Thirdly, it's important to highlight that these fan translations are all available for free online from various websites. For example, romhacking.net is a great source and also a very reputable site to source fan translations, but please be aware that you will need to provide your own copy of the game to apply the patch itself. So for legal purposes, I won't be discussing how to actually play translated games using emulators or real hardware, but Trust me, a few seconds on Google and I'm sure you'll be able to piece it all together, no problem. And lastly, instead of doing a full review for each game like we'd normally do on this channel, we're just going to be taking a quick look at each game instead. The purpose of this video isn't to review these games, nor is it to review the quality of the translations, it's pretty much just to make people aware of the translations that are currently available on the Dreamcast, and hopefully, maybe even help you discover a few new games worth trying. Alright, so with that out of the way, let's get into it. We've got 23 games to get you, and as always, we're gonna do it in alphabetical order. Starting with... Here we have Advanced Dice Senryaku 2001, which unsurprisingly came to the Dreamcast in the year 2001. This popular series of Japanese tactical war games dates all the way back to the mid 80s, and has seen maybe 50 or more entries across various computers and consoles ever since, and out of all of those games, only two entries have ever been localized for the West. But thanks to this fan translation, we can now play the only Dreamcast entry in the series. What a time to be alive. I'll tell you when wasn't a good time to be alive though, World War II, which is also what this game centers around. I guess a good way to describe the series is like a more serious and historically accurate version of Advance Wars. You capture locations and resources, build units and vehicles, and then guide them across a map turn by turn to take out enemies and capture more locations. Lovely stuff. Now I will say this series can be a bit daunting for newcomers. There's some mechanics and systems that will take a little while to get to grips with, but as any fan of this series will attest, if you take the time to understand everything, Dyson Ryaku is one of the most rewarding and deep turn-based war series out there, and the Streamcast entry is certainly no exception. One of the more unique entries on today's list, next up we have Blue Submarine No. 6, Saigetsu Fumahito Time and Tide, a game that is part visual novel and part submarine scavenger sim. This game is based on the OVA series of the same name, which in turn is based on the 60s manga of the same name, a post-apocalyptic story about the Earth's oceans rising and wiping out most of the Earth's population. It's Good to see people were predicting our inevitable demise all the way back in the 60s. Interestingly, this game was both published and developed by Sega themselves, meaning the quality level is top notch right out the gate. The game essentially sees you working as a scavenger, running odd jobs to make ends meet. You take a mission at the local outpost, head out into the ocean to find some lost belongings, fight some angry fish along the way, and then buy some upgrades for your sub with the money you make while doing it. 
I can't really say I've played anything else quite like this on the console. The underwater gameplay control is great, the narrative sections are entertaining with plenty of interesting characters, and since it's a first party title, the graphics and sound are unsurprisingly all excellent too. There's a reason this game is one of the most expensive import titles available for the console, and with this fan translation making the game more accessible to everybody, well you'd be a fool not to check it out. Definitely one of the most bizarre games we'll be looking at today. Next up we have Boko Yume no Tatsujin, a very obscure 2001 release for the console that seemingly only ended up being translated for a laugh, which ain't my words, but the words of the translator animated AF, a man with no Japanese knowledge who wanted to see how easy it was to translate a Dreamcast game, and since all the text in this game was image based, it turns out it was surprisingly easy. So there you go, here's Boko Yume no Tatsujin, a very quirky life simulator where you perform odd jobs for cash. Ever handed out leaflets, worked at a restaurant door, carried some heavy objects up some stairs, well now you can experience it all over again in Japanese video game form. Now I was quite entertained and also very confused while playing this game. I'm not sure if I found any aspect of it particularly enjoyable, the actual gameplay is very cumbersome, almost to the point where it seems like it was by design, maybe to really capture the real life woes of working a job, who knows, but it's a... Uh, Interesting, let's just put it that way. Now the translation is actually still ongoing. While all the text has been translated making the game fully playable, there is still a large amount of video and voice scenes which are still yet to be translated and according to the translation's creator, the plan is to actually bring people in to record all these parts in English and then add them to the game, so you can't say they aren't going the extra mile. Now whether or not that all pans out remains to be seen, but if you like quirky games with fun visuals and mundane tasks, well, Boko you may know that Sujin may be the one for you. Chaos Field is the first of three games on this list from developer Milestone Incorporated, and also conveniently the first game Milestone ever created. Chaos Field is a vertical shoot 'em up, a genre the Dreamcast is pretty well known for thanks to its many, many arcade ports. And since all of Milestone's shooters at the time originated on Sega's popular Naomi arcade hardware, an eventual port to the Dreamcast was a no brainer. Chaos Field was a pretty late release in the Dreamcast lifespan, coming out in 2004, and while I would consider this game Milestone Stone's weakest of their Dreamcast trilogy, it still definitely showcases the strength of their games, most notably their ability to fill the screen with bullets and also their incredible soundtracks. Now Chaos Field is an outlier because unlike your traditional caravan style shooter, this game is really just a series of boss fights. Each level involves you taking out massive enemies piece by piece, making for some very intense battles. You've got a total of three different ships at your disposal, each with their own unique weapons, offering up a different style of gameplay to suit your individual preference, but beyond that though, the game's main gimmick is the ability to switch to the chaos dimension at the press of a button, which not only boosts your attack greatly, but also the enemy that you're fighting against giving the game a nice risk reward system which I'm not terrible at using whatsoever. It is a very tough game but also a very fun one and even if you aren't a shoot 'em up fan it's probably worth checking out for the music alone. Seriously it is very very good. Here's one for the wrestling fans. Next up, we've got Fire Pro Wrestling D. What does the D stand for? Uh, Dreamcast probably, I don't know. Fire Pro Wrestling is one of the longest running wrestling game series around, and while the game oftentimes doesn't feature actual licensed wrestlers, the game does feature a bunch of wrestlers who look almost exactly like certain licensed wrestlers. Quite a few of them, actually. But remember, due to international copyright law, this is 100% not Hulk Hogan, or Steve Austin, or Kane. It's just a legally different big red machine. Earl Hebner is actually in it though, so that's kind of fun. Now the biggest selling point of the Fire Pro series has always been its incredible levels of customization, from the wrestlers to the moves to the belts. Fire Pro really does let you play out all of your wrestling booking fantasies, and on top of that, 
There's a really deep and entertaining wrestling game beneath it all too. The AI programming in this game is so good that I often just like to watch the CPUs battle it out because the matches end up being pretty entertaining in their own right. Sometimes you just want to sit back, relax and watch Goldberg and Rikishi take each other out in a barbed wire match, you know? There have been many games in the series since this release, the most recent Fire Pro World being especially good, but if you're looking for some fun wrestling action on the Dreamcast with Fire Pro Wrestling D, you really can't go wrong. Also, you can have explosive death matches, so, you know, 10 out of 10. It wouldn't be a translation video without FromSoft making an appearance, and here they are with their sole Dreamcast release, 1999's Frame Gride. So, FromSoft, we know them, we love them. This video is actually being worked on right in the middle of all this Elden Ring hype, and if you're wondering why it's taken me so damn long to get this thing out, that is probably the reason why. But anyway, here's Frame Gride, a game that answers the question. What if we took the medieval fantasy setting of Kingsfield and combined it with the mech-based arena fighting of the Armored Core series? And no, I'm not actually making that up. FromSoft really made a medieval fantasy mech combat game, and it's here on the Dreamcast. The game itself plays very similar to older Armored Core titles from a control standpoint, and while the customization aspect is still very much intact, this game definitely feels more like a traditional 1v1 fighting game. Don't expect to find any missions or exploration here. Just get dropped into a cool arena and take out an enemy mech as a giant mechanical knight using guns, magic, and a big old sword. You love to see it. It's definitely a game that's geared more towards fans of the Armored Core series, but as a concept, it's just so ludicrous and strange that it kind of merits trying based on the idea alone. So if you want to try one of FromSoft's deepest cuts, well, this Dreamcast exclusive fantasy mech fighting game is certainly worth a look. Our second of three milestone shoot 'em ups to appear, and their last to appear on the console, here we have Karus, which isn't just Milestone's final Dreamcast game, this is in fact the final officially released Dreamcast game, releasing in 2007 in Japan. Yeah, the Dreamcast lasted just a little bit longer over there, just just a little bit. Anyway, Karus is probably my favourite of Milestone's three vertical shooters on the console, and it mostly comes down to the straightforward but satisfying level up mechanic in this game. You see, in Karus, you strengthen up your weapons depending on how often you use them. Kill enemies with your shot, it'll level it up. Kill with your sword, it levels it up. Just smashing the enemies with your shield, yeah, that levels up too. Better yet, why not just absorb a bunch of bullets using your cool brain shield? Yeah, this game is kind of strange, but it's fun though. Aesthetically, the game uses a cell shade its style similar to another milestone game we're going to take a look at down the line, but Karis definitely features a darker and more oppressive colour palette and tone, and to match this, the game features one hell of an intense soundtrack featuring elements of drum and bass, dub and IDM to create one of the most memorable soundtracks on the console in my opinion. It's not often I can say a boss track sounds like a square pusher cut, but in this game, I can. Karis may be the Dreamcast's final official release, but with a quality shoot 'em up like this, I can at the very least say that it went out with a bang. The game is called LOL, but nobody's laughing because this time around, LOL stands for Lack of Love, an evolutionary life simulator from Love the Lick, the team behind the much-loved PS1 titles Moon and UFO. And of course, if you're familiar with their work, it'll come as no surprise that this game is equal parts strange as it is artistic and beautiful. The story is based around humans sending out robots across the universe to find a new planet to call their own, all while you take the role of a life form native to that planet, going through the evolutionary life cycle on said planet. Gameplay wise, it's in the same vein of games like Evo on the Super Nintendo or more recently Spore, I guess. Your goal is to wander environments, befriending creatures and warding off threats, all with the goal of surviving and evolving into bigger, more dominant creatures. You've got dedicated buttons to attack, communicate with creatures and even a button just for peeing, which uh, you love to see, I guess. While the gameplay here may not be to everybody's taste, there's always something truly special about Love Deluxe games, and Lack of Love is certainly no exception. Plus, famed Japanese composer Ryuchi Sakamoto was heavily involved in the creation of this game. Not only did he make the game's beautiful atmospheric soundtrack, but he was also the game's scenario writer. So if you're looking for something artistic, beautiful, and oftentimes very, very weird, well, Lack of Love will no doubt deliver in spades. Now, 
the pal tale, Arcea and Daydream was a game that was at the top of my wish list for potential fan translations for the longest time. This 2000 release from Sega is a platformer with a wonderful fairy tale like aesthetic, and while platformers are generally quite easy to import without having to worry about the language barrier, Nepal Tale features a lot of text that can make traversing its world a bit of a struggle for non Japanese readers, but thankfully, after a long wait, the game finally received a fan patch in 2019, and let me tell you, it was worth the wait. What makes Nepal Tales so good isn't just its charming aesthetic, its engaging characters and plot, and straightforward yet fun, charming platforming gameplay, but the way it combines all of these things together. You see, while Nepal Tale was developed internally at Sega, unusually for a Japanese game at the time, the majority of the staff working on this game were women, meaning the game has a very distinct feminine tone that permeates throughout the entire game. And back in a time when games were heavily geared towards men, playing a beautiful past Still platformer with vibrant bouncy environments and a crafting system that allows you to create fun animal companions like a manatee whose whole purpose is just to cheer you on, well this game just offered up something different that hit all the right notes for me. And not only that, the game features another stunning soundtrack on the console coming from none other than Yoko Kano who is only the composer for Cowboy Bebop amongst many other influential properties. And when I say this thing is good, I really mean it. Seriously, if you've never heard of Nepal Tale before, it is one of the console's very best exclusive titles and is a must for any platforming fan or just people who like good video games. I'm sure there's got to be some of you out there. Hey kids, do you like typing? Do you like existential dread and a feeling of complete hopelessness? Well finally, thanks to Derek Pascarella's translation patch for Neon Genesis Evangelion Typing Project D and Typing Project Advanced, we've got the games for you. Now for the record, these are two separate games, but since they are essentially both the same thing, I figured it makes sense to include them both under the one segment. These are a duo of Neon Genesis Evangelion themed typing tutors aimed at teaching you the fundamentals of typing while giving you a nice dose of Evangelion fan service in the process. If you like the music, characters and aesthetic of the series, well these games are going to give you what you want. The first game in the series, Project E, is the beginner option giving you a selection of 6 different mini games with a bonus unlockable 7 game if you're good enough. And the second game, Type in Project Advanced, offers up more of the same but with 7 new games and a tougher difficulty curve this time around. Naturally to play this one you're going to need a Dreamcast keyboard or if you're like me you can play it on a PC using an emulator. Although. That being said, the dev build of the emulator I was using did not play nice with my keyboard, so I could not play this game uh, very well at all. I know it looks like I'm very bad at typing, but trust me, that's only about 75% true. Either way, while the Evangelion theming is certainly very nice, I still wouldn't say this is the flashiest or most content rich typing tutor out there, but for players who love Evangelion and are looking to get some use out of their Dreamcast keyboards, you really can't go wrong with either of these titles. Everybody else? Just play Typing of the Dead instead, aka the funniest game ever made. Up next we have Panzerfront, which is also the most recent Dreamcast fan translation, which only came out in February of 2022. So. As always, it's a good thing I checked midway through making this thing. Panzerfront is a World War II tank simulator, which lets you take the role of a tank commander in missions based on historical campaigns that took place during the war. Each of the tanks behave and control quite differently from one another, and the game gives you a selection of control options catering to beginners or those who want to experience the difficulty of controlling a tank in the 1940s. And let me tell you, it is difficult to control a tank built in the 1940s. This is another game with a steep learning curve, but naturally considering this is aimed towards those with an interest in simulation and historically accurate titles, that's kind of what you'd want really. The game also launched on the PS1 with that version seeing an official localization in the West, but the Dreamcast version's improved performance and graphics make this the definitive version of the game in my book. Also as a side note, an updated version of this game with additional content called Panzerfront Biz got released a year later as a PlayStation exclusive in Japan, and while a European version was in the works due to the publisher JVC closing its video game branch prior to its release, the localization never seen a release, but a beta version of this localization has since been made available on the internet, so if you want to play even more Panzerfront, well, now you can, at least on the PS1 anyway. <laughs> 
The final milestone game on our list and the second to be released on the Dreamcast, it's Redurgy, which surprise surprise is another vertical shoot 'em up and another good one too. Who'd have guessed? Redurgy aesthetically and mechanically shares a lot in common with the last milestone game we looked at, Karis, from the weapons and ship design to the cell shaded graphics and art style. But one thing that clearly sets it apart from Karis is Redurgy's color and tone. If Karis is the edgy got sibling, then Redurgy is the peppy popular sibling. It's basically this dynamic but in game form. Of course, there are other differences too, mainly the way that you power up your weapons and the scoring system. Redurgy relies on a more traditional system for buffing your weapons by just collecting items that drop from enemies, but the scoring in this game is a bit more complicated this time around. Using your shield to damage enemies or deflect bullets increases a meter that gives you a score multiplier, so you've got to strategically use this if you want to get big points throughout the game, rather than just blowing up everything that immediately comes onto the screen. Also, Milestone knocks it out of the park with the music once again, giving us another top tier soundtrack that's much dancier in comparison to the previous games, but it is perfect for this game's video visuals and tone, and one of my absolute all-time favorite shoot 'em up soundtracks. Redurgy is probably the most popular of milestone shoot 'em ups, and as such has seen a number of follow-ups, with the most recent game, Redurgy Swag, seeing a release on the Nintendo Switch. And while the fan translations are a great way to play the three milestone games that we looked at today, all three of the games, Chaos Field, Karas, and Redurgy, did see an official localization on the Wii as part of the Ultimate Shooting Collection. Now that being said, some fans aren't a fan of the official localizations of these games, but the gameplay is at least as good as ever. So no matter which way you decide to check these games out, they all 100% come highly recommended. Another series that isn't a stranger to the old fan translation is the Cotton series from developer Success, and one of its most unique entries is definitely the Dreamcast exclusive Rainbow Cotton. This game foregoes the series' traditional side-scroller routes and opts for the rail shooter formula, which was previously used before in the Mega Drive exclusive Panorama Cotton. Now, while the gameplay doesn't really require any knowledge of the Japanese language to enjoy, the game does feature a large number of animated story sequences, which tie the whole thing together, and now, thanks to the fan translation, you can finally understand why a witch is terrorizing fish in some underwater rooms. And I will say, while I quite enjoy both the Cotton series and rail shooters for that matter, something about this game just feels a little bit off to me. The weapons just aren't very punchy, the controls are a bit weird, and I think Cotton's character model blocks a little bit too much of the screen for my liking. I don't know, given the previous entries in the series, I just expected this game to be better. That being said, it is still fun for what it is, and if you like rail shooters and Cotton, well, thanks to the fan translation, there's no better time to give this game a whirl. Ah, Resident Evil. We know it, we love it. It's given us such classics as dog jumping through window, giant vampire lady, and also that laser trap scene in the movie. But back in the Dreamcast days, Capcom made a bet on the Dreamcast being a big old hit, and as we all know, that didn't work out very well. As such, one of the Dreamcast's biggest exclusives, Resident Evil Code Veronica, eventually made its way to other platforms, under the new title of Resident Evil Code Veronica X, an enhanced version of the original with new content, new cutscenes, and also a redesign of Steve's haircut for some reason. Now, what you may not know is that while Code Veronica X did make its way to the PS2 and GameCube in the West, Code Veronica X actually first released once again on the Dreamcast, but as a Japan-only exclusive under the title Biohazard Code Veronica Kanzenban. So if you want to play the updated version of Code Veronica on the console where it originally launched, well, thanks to this fan translation, now you can. What happens when Sega takes their premier tactical RPG dating sim and combines it with Sega's B-tier puzzle franchise? Well, you get Sakura Wars Columns, of course, but that game is on the Saturn, so today we'll be talking about its follow-up, Sakura Wars Columns number 2. Now, I've dabbled in some Sakura Wars, and I've also dabbled in some Columns for that matter, and I gotta say, while all the story content in this game, of which there is a ton, is very much geared towards Sakura Wars fans and people who like dating anime girls, what I wasn't expecting was by far the best version of Columns that I have ever played. There's enough tweaks to the formula here by adding in some of the tactical and 
power-up elements seen in the Sakura Wars games to really take the traditional columns gameplay to the next level. Honestly, this is such a content-packed game with individual story scenarios for each character, various different modes and more columns action than the average person can probably handle. So if you like columns and on a lesser note, Sakura Wars, this is absolutely the puzzle game for you and the definitive columns experience. I've never heard of Seven Mansions Ghastly Smile. I've never met Seven Mansions Ghastly Smile. I guess what I'm trying to say is I had no idea what the hell this game was. But let me tell you, I'm glad I got to try it. What we have here is a very cheesy survival horror title that features all the hallmarks of the era, from the silly dialogue all the way down to the awkward tank controls. But Seven Mansions actually offers more than you'd expect. The game has two campaigns, one for each of its playable characters, with one focusing more on action and the other focusing more on puzzles. But more impressively, the game also features a full two-player co-op campaign, allowing you and a friend to play together in split screen, which Probably won't be very scary, but you know it's going to be very funny. The game also allows you to swap your camera angle on the fly from first person, fixed camera and third person modes, which is actually quite a neat feature for a game of its time and certainly helps with aiming or stabbing, I guess. This is a nice hidden gem for survival horror fans on the console and if you're tired of playing Code Veronica and Dino Crisis over and over again or are just looking for a good time with a friend, Seven Mansions should definitely be on your radar. <laughs> One of Sega's most iconic franchises, Space Channel 5 was one of the console's most eye-catching games, really showcasing Sega at the peak of their creativity. I mean, a retro future rhythm game based around space news broadcasts full of music inspired by the 50s and 60s. I'll have whatever these guys are smoking. Also, Michael Jackson was in it too, because why not? So, as you can imagine, one of the biggest disappointments for Dreamcast fans in the West was seeing the second entry in the series, Space Channel 5 Part 2, staying as a Japan-only exclusive. Of course, the game would eventually see a Western release on the PS2, Xbox 360 and PC, but if you want to play it on its home, a fan translation is the only way to do it. Now, interestingly, this translation basically uses all the sound files and certain assets from the PS2 port, meaning some of the icons in-game actually feature the PS2 inputs over the Dreamcast buttons, which is uh, unusual to say the least. But hey, it's Space Channel 5 Part 2 in English on the Dreamcast. We can't really complain, can we? This still remains one of the kookiest and most charming rhythm games around. It's challenging, visually stunning, and the music is oh, Oh so good. It's Sega at their very best and a must play for any Dreamcast fan. Next up, we have what might be my favorite puzzle game of all time, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 X for Matching Service. It's uh, quite the mouthful. So this is a port of the much loved Super Puzzle Fighter 2, which originated in the arcades and has been ported to pretty much everything at this stage. Or at least I hope it has. As a puzzle game, it's one of the easiest to pick up and play, offers incredibly satisfying gameplay both solo and competitively, plus it has great music and cute chibi renditions of Street Fighter and Darkstalkers characters. I mean, come on, what's, what's not to love? So what's new in the Dreamcast version? Well, not a whole lot really. The big draw of this version of the game was the inclusion of online play utilizing Capcom's matching service, which I don't think you'll be getting much use out of nowadays, but it was a novel addition for the time, that's for sure. On top of that, there's two new additional modes modes called Puzzle Fighter Y and Z that adjust the rules a little bit to freshen things up. It's nothing groundbreaking, but hey, it's more Puzzle Fighter and there ain't nothing wrong with that. Really, this is a game that you can play easily enough without the fan patch, and truthfully, the fan patch doesn't really translate that much outside of the options menu anyway, so uh, hey, you can take it or leave it. Just play Super Puzzle Fighter, it's really good. And speaking of take it or leave it, here's Super Street Fighter 2 X for matching service, another Capcom port, now with the added bonus of online play. If you thought the days before rollback netcode were bad, imagine playing this thing with dial-up. The 2000s were wild, man, let me tell you. So yeah, this is just a very good port of Super Street Fighter 2. It runs well, it plays well, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Now, I like Street Fighter 2 as much as the next guy, but if I'm playing a fighting game on the Dreamcast, I'd personally opt for pretty much any other fighting game on the platform, of which there are a lot. But hey, if you're looking for a version of Super Street Fighter 2 on the Dreamcast and want the options menu translated, well, this fan patch is the way to go. I cannot believe somebody actually translated 
this game. Derek Pascarella, you absolute madman. The dude's translated nearly a quarter of the games on this list, and he only goes and translates the bane of PAL Dreamcast collectors everywhere. So, a little backstory, Taxi 2 Le Jou is a French-only PAL release based on the Luc Besson movie Taxi 2. These movies are excellent, by the way. Well, the French versions, that is. You might remember the American version that came out in 2004, starring Queen Latifah and Jimmy Fallon, and if you do, you probably wish you didn't. Anyway, this game here is based on the second movie and was a very late release in the Dreamcast life cycle and seeing as it only came out in France, the game has become quite the rarity over the years, fetching abnormally high prices and the worst thing of all, the game is absolutely terrible. The only reason people purchase this game is to complete their PAL Dreamcast collections. Actually playing the thing is quite the struggle, let me tell you. It plays like any old arcade racer where you try to beat the clock, but with some of the twitchiest handling and narrow tracks you will ever see, and crashing even once in this game is enough to completely ruin a run, and these levels are much longer than you'd expect too. As a novelty, I kind of love that this game got translated. It is truly one of the rarest and most obscure Western Dreamcast games and playing it in English is kind of surreal in a way, but that being said, the game's fucking shite. The Lost Golem is another interesting title. This game was developed by a group of recently graduated students going by the name Caramel Pot, and when the game eventually released in Japan in February of the year 2000, it unfortunately sold less than 500 copies total in its first year on sale, making it one of the worst selling games on the platform. Of course, we love a good underdog story, and this fun little puzzle game has become somewhat of a cult classic in the years since its launch, and rightly so, because the game itself is a pretty fun time. In The Lost Golem, we play as a golem whose job it is to guide a little king to safety by creating paths using the ancient art of pushing walls. It's a very simple concept, but hey, when it works, it works. The game's story is told briefly through cutscenes in between levels, and in spite of the game's rather simple graphics and visual style, there's just something pleasant and charming about the whole experience, and the music is rather nice too. You can kind of feel the indie spirit while playing this game, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. It's a labor of love from a bunch of students who are just getting started in the industry, and seeing the game go from being one of the worst selling games on the platform to getting a full English translation for dum-dums like me to enjoy, well, that's quite the journey, I think you'll agree. Our final game on today's list isn't even a game, but a demo for Shenmue, and not just any demo, it's a demo with exclusive content. So, I'm gonna assume you all know Shenmue, I mean, if you made it this long into a Dreamcast fan translation video and don't know Shenmue, uh, thanks for watching, go play Shenmue. So after a few delays for Shenmue in Japan, Sega decided to release a demo titled Watch Shenmue to fans who had previously pre-ordered the game, which unsurprisingly let us know a little bit about Shenmue. The package includes some tech demo stuff that was included on some previous Shenmue Passport discs. These allow you to play around with the lighting and models so you can really see how ahead of the curve the graphics tech was at the time. But most importantly, the disc also features an exclusive playable demo which sees you hunting down the real-life managing director of Sega at the time, Kazo Yukawa, and if you've ever seen this iconic image of Mr. Yukawa sitting next to a bunch of unsold Dreamcasts in his office, this is where it originated from. So, as a demo of Shenmue, it gives you a great snapshot of pretty much everything the game has to offer, from the open world, the dialogue, the minigames, and of course the quick time events. But more importantly, as a weird piece of Sega history, this is genuinely one of the funniest things that I've ever played. This whole thing is such a Sega thing to do. They were never afraid to be self-referential or just take the piss out of themselves, and this whole demo is just a perfect encapsulation of that Sega spirit. And hey, if you also really like Shenmue, well, I'm sure giving this unique mini Shenmue experience a whirl is also very much worth your time. Well, there you have it. That was a look at 23 fan translations currently available on the Sega Dreamcast. And while this does represent the majority of the fan translations out there, it is possible that I may have missed some. And considering the rate that we've been getting new translations over the last few years, this video will of course no doubt be out of date real soon anyway. I'm looking at you, Mr. Pascarella. As always, I'd like to say a big thank you to all the translators and hackers out there helping make these games more accessible to a wider audience. If you decide to play any of these games yourself at home, make sure to let the people behind the patches know you appreciate them. Shoot them a message, donate to their Patreons or coffee accounts. These guys are out there doing this for free and it's important we make sure they give them some love back. Now before I finish up the video, I'd like to leave you with a final question. If you could pick any Dreamcast game to receive a future fan translation, 
what would it be? My pick would be Eldorado's Gate, which is a massive seven-part turn-based RPG from Capcom with some beautiful 2D sprite work. Although expecting somebody to translate a seven-part video game series is a uh, kind of an asshole answer. So I'm actually going to go with the popular option and say Sega Gaga, please. Please, somebody, anybody, translate Sega Gaga. Thank you. Anyway, thanks so much for sticking around and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like what you've seen, you can of course subscribe for more long videos about old video games. And if you didn't, well, make sure to berate me in the comments. That's, that's always fun to wake up to as well. Either way, thank you so much for your time. And remember, we got to keep the dream alive. See ya.